We are two days away from the start of the Ohio State 2022 college football season, where they're open the season playing the number five team in the land, the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. And today's show is all about previewing the matchup and getting to know the Buckeyes' first opponent during the college football season. Notre Dame is good. How good are they? How talented are they? We'll answer those questions and a whole lot more today on Locked on Buckeyes. You are Locked on Buckeyes, your daily podcast on the Ohio State Buckeyes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, Buckeye fans? Welcome back to another episode of Locked On Buckeyes for the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jay Stevens, also the host of the Jay Stevens Podcast. It is Thursday, September 1st in the year 2022, and I want to thank you for making Lots on Buckeyes your first listen or first watch of every single day. On today's episode, we welcome back to the podcast, Mr. Brian Driscoll. Brian is the publisher of irishbreakdown.com. Brian was with us a couple weeks ago, giving us and providing an early look at the Notre Dame Fighting Irish, but today we get a little bit deeper, have some nerd notes for you as Brian breaks down the Notre Dame offense and defense and what we can expect to see from the Irish on Saturday night against the Ohio State Buckeyes. This is a phenomenal team to open your season with. It's one of those rare times that the book has an Irish play in the regular season. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this fun preview of this weekend's season opener against Notre Dame with Brian Driscoll of Irish Breakdown. And joining us now here on Locked on Buckeyes, once again, is Brian Driscoll. He is the publisher of irishbreakdown.com. Brian was with us a couple weeks ago now, kind of giving us an early look at Notre Dame. And he's here this week to preview the game, which is coming up in just a couple days. Brian, welcome back to Locked on Buckeyes. Oh, I'm excited to be back. I'm just glad it's finally game week. You know, it's just let's find out what these two teams are made of and and let's kick off the season. And, you know, I got to. I got a pretty bold takeaway that I'm going to have from this from this show that I think some Ohio State fans may like, may not like. Who knows? We'll see. But uh, it's going to be a fun last couple of days, and I just I can't wait to see this game kick off. I can't wait either, man. Week zero was a great appetizer, a great tease for what's going to happen this weekend with games happening Thursday through Monday. You got Florida State LSU on Sunday night. I believe you have a game Monday night. Clemson, Georgia Tech, yeah. Clemson, Georgia Tech, you're correct. Yeah. Um, Purdue, Penn State on uh, Thursday. You get the backyard yeah. brawl back. Yeah. You get Ohio State and Notre Dame on Sunday night. Oregon and Georgia, like, let's love go. It. I'm love ready it. for this. Utah Brian, I said this to stuff. Florida to the swamp to head, go down to Florida. You know, Cincinnati, can they, you know, the, all the guys they lost, they got to head to Arkansas. Sam Pittman going to keep that thing rolling, man. There's so many awesome storylines in week one. It's going to be a great week. But there's nothing, Jay, nothing like that matchup happening in Columbus on Saturday night. Brian, it's the wildest thing. I look at the history of the series. The seventh game all time between these two schools. And geographically, as you know, as you just drove to uh, Ohio, Kenton, Ohio, for some things you were doing, the drive is not that far. Geographically, no. these schools are not that far apart. No. And you would think two powers in the Midwest, two powers in college football, you would think they might do a home-and-home -home series more often or possibly meet up a little bit more in the bowl games. Big Ten ties to the Rose Bowl, keeps them out of playing Notre Dame in a lot of bowl games in pe previous decades. But I'm glad. I am glad we get schools that you look at their helmets, you know who those teams mm -hmm. are, you know what they represent, and I'm glad we're finally getting this game. And I hope we get it more often over the next 5, 10, 15 years. Yeah, you know, it's it's two of the most iconic helmets. It's two of the most iconic colors. I mean, it's the blue and gold versus the scarlet and gray. You know, it, like you said, geographically, it's to me, it's the two most dominant programs of the last 50 years in the North, with all due respect to Michigan and their one and a half national titles since the end of World War II. Uh, these are the two most dominant programs in the North the last 50 years. And like you said, if and if it's not for the 05 and 15 Fiesta Bowl matchups, they'd played even fewer times, you know, because like if you think about it, since the 96 game, they've only played twice and that was both in the Fiesta Bowl. And so it it, it is wild. And, you know, I grew up in Ohio as a Notre Dame fan and it was just like not even really something that I really thought about, you know, because they just didn't play. There was no history there. Like at the time growing up, they'd only, they hadn't played since the 30s. You know, because I grew up in the 80s and, and early 90s. So it 
it's fun to get it back. And, and, you know, we talked last time about what I'd like to see happen. I, I, I don't, I'm not really a, interested in having like an annual matchup, but you know, every decade having that sort of home, home neutral thing would be, I think be a lot of fun with, for these two teams. Be a lot of fun for people like us. Be a lot of fun for fans in general. Be a lot of fun for the players and the coaches. But also it's great for recruiting because I saw Ohio yeah. State's – I've heard about Ohio State's guest list this weekend. It is extensive. I would assume that it would be the same way for Notre Dame next year oh, yeah. when the Buckeyes come oh, up yeah. to South Bend for yeah. that game next year. Brian, no this game's going to be fun. But Notre Dame is a team that's not the favorite, that is not hyped <laughs> up right now like the Buckeyes are. I'm just going to say – <laughs> Let's take the obvious. Like people, are like you're trying to take shots at Notre Dame. No, it's literally all over Vegas. It doesn't matter what seventeen and a half. To. Look, why does the shred keep going up? Because everybody keeps putting their money on Ohio State, and Vegas is just begging people to put money on Notre Dame. That's why the spread keeps going up. But yeah, yeah, there, there, there's not a lot of people giving Notre Dame a lot of. A lot. Not only do, it's what's wild is people aren't even not only giving Notre Dame a shot to win. They're not even giving them much of a shot to be competitive. Correct. Correct. That's the thing that surprises me. Like, look, I don't care if it was Bama or Georgia or anybody. You're going to Columbus, the number two team in the country. It's hard to say, I expect you to beat them. Like, come on. Like, you got a shot to win, but to expect it. But this notion that the number five team in the country is not even going to be competitive and from all the, I say, you know, hate responses I get on my YouTube channel and my thing and my DMs. I think Ohio State fans probably think it should be even a greater spread. Like they think 17 and a half is underdoing it. So we'll we'll find out. But look, I understand it, Jay. I, I wrote an article about this the other day. Hey, Notre Dame fans, if you don't want, you know, hey, Notre Dame, if you don't want this disrespect to continue, stop getting pounded every time you have one of these type of games. That's you know, and, and like what's the exception? It's 2020 Clemson. Well, they played that game without Trevor Lawrence. They didn't have Tyler Davis. They didn't have Mike Jones in that game. And you still need a double overtime to beat right, them. Right. And then they get those guys back in the ACC title game. It's 34 to 10. And it's like, okay, here, here we go again, right? So, I mean, that's kind of the legacy Brian Kelly left. If you're inferior to Notre Dame, they're going to beat you. If you're as good or better than Notre Dame, you're going to lose. And a lot of times lose, with the exception of Georgia, lose kind of convincingly, I should say, is a nice way of putting it, for more often than not. Yeah, and I find that it's the number five team in the country, Notre Dame, who, like you just said so well, is getting disrespected. Um, I don't care what Brian Kelly has done or what he did at Notre Dame. Notre Dame was always one of the better teams in the country at the end of the season. Sure. If you if you like what the polls say and things sure. like that, they're always up there. But I always have a great respect for Notre Dame, and I hope the Buckeyes have a great respect for the for the Irish going into this game this weekend. Because if they don't, the Irish may shock them. Yeah. Even though there's not the hype around Notre Dame like there is around the Buckeyes, I still think you and Notre Dame fans believe that Notre Dame is going to be competitive in this game from start to finish. What are some general thoughts or kind of early say expectations about the team, even though it's not really hyped up sure. like Ohio State is right now. Well, they should be competitive against Ohio State. I mean, that needs to be the expectation number one. And it's 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 you're talking like you said, it is the number five team in the country. It is a team that's won at least 10 games each of the last five years and, and a team that has a lot of talent coming back. You know, you have four different players that are preseason all Americans, four different guys that are projected by at least one different draft analyst to be a first round NFL draft pick. You got one of the best edge rushers in the country and Isaiah Foskey. Notre Dame's defensive line has been really good in recent years. Their best players are all coming back. They've got some young, you know, guys that were relatively highly ranked, although, you know, recruiting rankings don't mean a ton, as, as you and I discussed right, kind of right. before the show. But just some talented guys. You had some, you know, their Will linebacker, Maris Lulafau, was expected to be the starter last year at Will, and he got hurt in training camp. He was having a great fall camp. So you get him back. You you get in an All-American from Northwestern and Brandon Joseph, who Ohio State fans remember very well. Mm -hmm. intercepted Justin Fields in the end zone in the Big Ten title game a couple of years ago. You got Cam Hart coming back. And, you know, so the expectation is that Notre Dame should still be really good on defense again. And they've been, you know, very good. They were number 14 last year in the nation in scoring defense. And that was with giving up 37 points in the in the Fiesta Bowl to Oklahoma State in a game where they were, you know, kind of just going through a, a coaching change and a coaching transition and all those type of things. And Marcus Freeman did not call the defense of that game because he was – he wanted to – let some other people try it out, and he was trying to get himself acclimated to being the head coaching role. So you still had a top 15 scoring defense. And so I think the expectation that you, you expect Notre Dame to be good, then you kind of get into some of the unknowns. Okay, now can their offense take a step up? Because honestly, Jay, that's the thing that's been holding Notre Dame back in these years. I mean, you know, you look at the 2018 playoff game against Clemson. I mean, you held them to 30 points, and that may not seem like a lot, but you know, that that's – 
that's kind of you, – you need to be there in that range to, to beat Clemson. You need to keep them in that 24 to 30 range. But they couldn't score. They scored three. You know, you held Alabama's offense to 31 points in the, the Rose Bowl a, a couple years later. Somewhat misleading statistic. I mean, Alabama did pull – you know, take their foot off the gas in the fourth quarter because they were up 31-7, and they knew they had another game to play against Ohio State, it turns out. But, you know, you still kind of kept them down compared to what they have done to some other teams. I mean, they hung over 50 on Al- on Ohio State in, in the championship game. So the defense has at least held, allowed them to be competitive, held Georgia to 20 points in their first matchup in 17, held them to 23 points in 2019 when they played. It's the offense that's been the problem. I scored 14 points in the BCS game in 2012, scored three points against Clemson in the 2018 playoff game, scored 14 points against Alabama in the playoff game two years ago in the Rose Bowl, and seven of those came really late in the game when it was, you know, Bama had their backups in, right? So, you know, that's going to be the key. Can Notre Dame's offense finally show up on this big stage? And, you know, that's that's the part that's the unknown at this point in time for Notre Dame. It is. And there's a guy that's a quarterback at Tyler Buckner. We talked last time and discussed if if the team's excited, if they support him, if they're behind him. You said yes, and you kind of displayed that very, very well. What kind of quarterback and player is Buckner? Well, he's a dynamic one. I mean, and that's the thing that's been lacking. You know, I kind of do this little fun name game. And the last two times Notre Dame has been in the playoffs, Jay, the last time they were in the quarterbacks for for the teams in the playoff were Justin Fields, Trevor Lawrence, Mac Jones, and... Ian Book, right? Ooh. One of these things is not Ooh. like the other, right? That, the 2018 yeah. playoff, the quarterbacks were Tua Tungvaloa, Kyler Murray, again, Trevor Lawrence, and Ian Book. You know, one of these things is not like the other. And that's really the thing that's been lacking at Notre Dame is when they've had dynamic quarterbacks, they weren't developed properly. You know, a guy like Malik Zaire, Malik Zaire gets hurt early in his first year as a starter. You know, Deshaun Kaiser regresses in year two. Brandon Wimbush regresses in year two. Well, Tyler Buckner is the guy that they're hoping can can break that streak. The, the talent quarterback at Notre Dame in recent years hasn't been that good. And Tyler Buckner is expected to be that guy that that is going to elevate it. He's a dynamic player. He As a high school junior, the last time he was a starting quarterback was as a junior in high school. Senior year got canceled because of COVID out in California. They didn't play their senior seasons. He's a kid that as a junior passed for over 4,400 yards and 58 touchdowns. Also rushed for 1,600 yards and 28 touchdowns that season. So you're talking about a kid that had over 6,000 yards of offense and over 80 touchdowns the last time he was a starting quarterback. Now, again, that's at the high school level. But what it does show is there is that dynamic all-around ability. And as Ohio State fans currently know, California produces some pretty good quarterbacks, right? So, you know, I think he's expected to be that. And Look, what's the thing Notre Dame's been missing in these big games, right? It's that quarterback that can put a team on his shoulders and say, hey, let, look, let's go do something here, right? Like, let's – let. I mean, Ohio State saw this in 2019 where I felt Ohio State outplayed Clemson at every position but one, and that was quarterback. You know, Trevor could just put that team on his shoulders and say, hey, I'm going to go do what I need to do. Kid went out and rushed for 100 yards. I mean, if he didn't do that, they don't beat Ohio State that day, Right. Ohio State's had a guy like that. I mean, Justin just comes out in 2020 and just shreds Clemson, you know, just rips them apart. You know, what Mac Jones did for Alabama, all these teams that are winning championships have dynamic players at quarterback. Notre Dame hasn't had that. They've had game managers, you know, guys like that. And the hope is is that that Tyler Bucker can be that guy. Now, will he be that guy in the very first start of his career? That remains to be seen. But at least he can go out there and hopefully make some plays and and, and allow this team to, to, to be competitive going into the fourth quarter. That's the goal, right? In a game like this, don't get overwhelmed early. Be competitive. Go into the fourth quarter with a chance. If you do that, then, you know, then, then let the chips fall where they may. And that's what Notre Dame is hoping that he can do. And then, of course, whatever happens, you build on it as you move forward in the rest of the year. Do you believe in Tyler Buckner? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think he's talented, right? But it's 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 like, okay, when you're locking about a guy that's never started a game before, you're saying, okay, I believe in the talent. Right, and I see a kid that's not only a dynamic athlete that was considered one of the best lacrosse players in the country, committed to Michigan as an eighth grader as a lacrosse player, then realized, yeah, it might not be a good place I want to go to school, so let me go to Notre Dame. I sorry, I can't help it. I love taking shots at Michigan, you know. But he's a kid. We love it. We love it around here. Just keep doing it the whole time. (laughs) People will love you. Um, You know, a really dynamic athlete has a good arm, shows great anticipation in practice. And, you know, that's the thing that Ian Book never had, right? Like, just the ability to process reads. I mean, Jay, you know this. A quarterback can't wait for a guy to get open and say, okay, he's open now. Let yeah. me throw it. Yeah, He's got to be able to anticipate, throw the throws guy, the guys open. And, you know, you see that from the great quarterbacks. You see C.J. Stroud do that. I, I mean, even especially I felt last year's the year went on. 
he got more and more and more mm -hmm. able to kind of make the big throws mm -hmm. where it's not system driven. It's just, right. wow, I didn't even see that guy coming open. And he went to his third read and bang that comeback route. You're like, I didn't, that's a, it's a great decision. It may not seem like a sexy throw, but just seeing him go to his third read and then knocking that thing out. Right, and, right. You know, Jackson's getting to the top end of his route and the ball's out. You know, I mean, that that's that anticipation that your quarterback needs to have that Ian Book just never had. He had to see a guy open before he could let a rip. You know, Tyler's a different kind of cat in that regard. Now, we see that in practice. We've seen that in spring game, not this past spring game, but the one before when he was a freshman. We saw that at times last year when he was in the game. But can he do that as the starter in front of 105,000 Buckeye fans? That remains to be seen, right? But the physical tools are there. That's what I believe in. But football is also a show-me business. And now Tyler's got to go out and show that that talent can actually be productive. And I think he will. And I think he's a talented kid. And I think he's the kind of guy that he elevates, right? He elevates those guys around you. And that's what a great quarterback has to be, is make the people around you better. He's got the talent to do it. Now he's got to go out and, and produce that way. Yes, he does. One thing that was a staple for Brian Kelly, which was one of the um, joys of watching Notre Dame football, was their offensive line play. Every year they had really good old linemen. How will the old line be this year? I mean, this weekend, this year, this weekend specifically, going up against a probably younger than normal Ohio State D line? Really talented, but they're pretty young. Not so much guys that have the experience playing significant minutes uh, in a lot of games and starting. So you have a lot of talent on Ohio State's D-line. that doesn't have the starting, the starting games under their belt, but you're probably going to have a, a, game, a Notre Dame off of the line that's ready chopping at the bit sure. to go up against those young guys. Well, the D-line for Ohio State sounds a lot like the Notre Dame quarterback situation, right? Talented, has played, but not necessarily been counted on to be the guy yet. And let's see if he can do it. And, you know, similar situation. That you, it's funny, you know, Notre Dame built this reputation on the back, this offensive line reputation on the back of Harry Heastan and what he built. And then the longer he was away, just to kind of the, just really got worse and worse and worse and worse. And last year was just a travesty, the way that the offensive line played last year. But it was never a talent problem, right? Like, you know, like this is what I keep hearing from Ohio State fans, right? And it's true. I, I agree with what they're saying to a degree where, you know, Ohio State wasn't as bad defensively as they looked. They have talent, but the coaching was bad. That's exactly what Notre Dame fans, and rightfully so, and my analysis is, is the talent last year wasn't the issue for Notre Dame's offensive line, with the exception of the right guard, who's not there anymore. It was a talented group. It was just about they weren't physical. They didn't come off the line with good pad level. They didn't move their feet. I mean, they caught a lot. You know, they would kind of come off and, like, wait for the defender to get yeah, to them and, yeah. like, catch a lot. And it's just like, I don't care who you are. You're not moving people when you're no. catching guys, you know. And it was just – they didn't finish. They couldn't get to the second level. They didn't use your hands well. And you're just like, this is such a poorly coached unit. And yet they still went out and went 11 and one, right? So that's the reason Notre Dame fans are optimistic. Well, you know, you've got two young stud, true sophomore offensive tackles for Notre Dame who played great down the stretch last year. You know, well, Joe Walt did, and then Blake Fisher comes in. He starts a half a game against Florida State, play has to go against Jermaine Johnson, does well, then gets hurt, misses the whole rest of the season. Then then his reward for coming back was, oh, by the way, you're going to face the team that leads the nation in sacks in Oklahoma State and Jim Knowles, that Jim Knowles defense. Oh, he didn't coach it, but that's the, the unit that he had built. And Notre Dame throws the ball over 70 times, 70 times meaning the number of pass, of passing plays they called. They only attempted 68, but they threw over 70 passes, and they each gave up a sack, and they were kind of covered late late in the, in the in the play coverage sacks. So they played great. They're big kids. Joe Walt, 6'7", 316. Blake Fisher, 6'6". And he's lost weight to get down to 327, kind of like Dewan Jones, you know, yeah. kind of lose that weight to get in good position. You got Jared Patterson back, assuming he plays. You know, Zeke Carell, Ohio kid, you know, top 100 recruit. So the talent's there, but it's getting the mentality back, right? Get back to being physical. Get back to being a team that can dominate in the run game. Notre Dame couldn't run the ball against a team with a pulse last year. Just couldn't. Couldn't run it on Wisconsin. Couldn't run it on Purdue. Couldn't run it on Oklahoma State. Couldn't run on Cincinnati. Couldn't run on anybody that could even remotely – stop anybody on offense. Well, now the hope, the expectation is, is that, that with Harry he stand back, now that talent starts turning into better production, better play, more toughness, using your hands correctly, and that you expect it to look like a Harry he stand line. So I think that's one of the things that I think a lot of Notre Dame fans are optimistic about is because we've seen what Harry he stand can do when he's got talent, and he's got talent. But again, it's okay how it, – it's the same thing with the Ohio State offensive line, right? Like – your offensive line didn't play great last year. Was it talent or was it coaching? Well, Ryan Day thinks it was a coaching issue. 
So he makes a change and brings in Justin Fry, who's a very good football coach, actually interviewed for the Notre Dame mobile line job when yeah. Harry Heastan left the last time. Uh, probably should have got it. Him or a uh, uh, guy that uh, ended up going to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers probably should have got the job over Jeff Quinn, but that's another story for another day. And the expectation is, okay, turn the talent into production. That's what Jim Knowles was hired to do on defense. Well, that's what Harry Heastan was hired to do on the Notre Dame offensive line. You got these studs, you got these really talented kids, Go turn them into something great, and everything I've heard through fall camp is that the offensive line has looked like you'd expect the Harry Easton offensive line to look like. And so I think that's going to make this game on Saturday really fun. Because, like, I mean, honestly, like, look, Jay, Ohio State, Notre Dame, Ohio State's got this high-powered offense. But when we really think about Ohio State, Notre Dame, and we think about it not just from, like, this matchup, but we think through the years, right, like going back to, you know, when we were kids and whether it was, like, you know, Jim Trestle, then going back to – even some of the old Bruce teams going back to Woody Hayes. I mean, what did Al what did Ohio State do to win a title in 14? They just ran it down Alabama's throat, right? And then they ran it down Oregon's throat. Like you think of trench play, right? Like, isn't that what we think of when we think of Ohio State Notre Dame? It's trench play. I mean, watching Orlando Pace just dominate dudes in the 90s. That's what I'm excited to see this year. Is like, okay, let's get Ohio State Notre Dame back to what they should be, which is kicking butt in the trenches. Because end of the day, I want Notre Dame to beat Ohio State on Saturday night. Uh, of course I do. But I want to start seeing some of these northern teams going down south and getting to these bowl games and just smacking the SEC teams around. Like, that's what I want to see. And that's where it's going to happen. It's going to have to happen. You you know, yeah, I got all these athletes. Well, so do they. Kick their butt in the trenches. And that's what I want to see both of these teams getting back to. We're on the same page right there. You mentioned the running game and offensive line play and all these things and what – Ryan Day thinks was a problem with the O-line last year. I could go a little bit deeper into saying it wasn't always a coaching problem, but sure. it's always a t it's talent. It's a multitude of issues. But you really hope in this year for the Buckeyes, they fix their O-line issues. I hope for Notre Dame, they fix their issues. It's just I still, as a fan, take the analyst hat off, I still want the Buckeyes to win the game. Sure, you want them to I fix still, it on September 10th, not September 3rd. <laughs> we're on the same page there, buddy. <laughs> But we talk about the old line, talk about Tyler Buckner, but there are some weapons yeah. that Notre Dame has on offense. I'm going to spend some time here with the defense as well. Lorenzo Styles, everyone might recognize that name. His brother, Sonny Styles, is a freshman at Ohio State right now. Michael Mayer, who Jim Knowles says is an NFL player right now, is someone that's going to, at the Buckets, will have to know where he is on the field at all time. Uh, Chris Tyree, five nine and a half, sitting at 197. Little short guy, but he can do some things on the football field as well. Those, we those are just three of the weapons that, th that Notre Dame has. But who are some other weapons, offensive skill weapons, the Irish have that the Buckeyes need you, fans need to know about? But also, I mean, if you want to go into depth about some of these guys I just mentioned, go for it. Well, you know, it's kind of funny. You know, I keep hearing how Notre Dame doesn't have – they don't have speed. They don't have speed. And I'm like, well, have you watched Notre Dame? Like, there's a lot of things wrong with that team last year. Uh, you know, because I like to say, you know, they were 11 and one, but they were 11 and one on, on the backs of a schedule in which they beat a grand total of zero teams to finish the year in the top 25. Right. I mean, it, it helped them kind of mask some of the coaching issues they had because they could just kind of out talent the teams that they play. But the, the talent's not the issue. I mean, you went out against that Oklahoma State defense and you had three guys go for over 100 yards. Well, two of them are coming back. You know, one of them is Chris Tyree, who, you know, two years in a row at the Under Armour Combine won the fastest man competition. You know, this is a kid that is a sophomore and a junior in high school, had the fit best, I think it was the 55-meter dash times, and he was an indoor track kid, not an outdoor track kid, had the fastest 55-meter dash times in the country, you know, for his for his age group. And you saw him, I mean, as a freshman be a home run. I mean, he's already got two 90-plus yard touchdowns in his career. Wisconsin kind of saw last year what happens when you leave him a little bit of a crease. You're not going to catch him. You know, you saw with Lorenzo Styles, obviously. And, you know, it's funny. I listen to all this hype about the Notre Dame, the Ohio State receivers and based on what they did in the bowl game about Emeka, Ubeka and Ubeka and Egbuka, excuse me, and then Marvin Harrison Jr., which is, I mean, justified. I think they're very, very good football players. Yeah, but those two kids combined for 117 yards and nine catches in the bowl game. Lorenzo Styles went for eight and 126 and a touchdown <laughs> against Oklahoma State. He smoked for a touchdown starting in the Ohio State secondary this year, you know? And so, and then you've got Braden Lindsey, who has a 70 yard touchdown, a 61 yard touchdown, or 62 yard touchdown, and a 51 yard touchdown in his, in his career. So, the one thing Notre Dame had is speed. What they didn't have was a, a, a group of players that knew how to play the game. I mean, you just watched the Oklahoma State game. Oklahoma State literally made two very small adjustments at halftime. Notre Dame ripped them apart in the first half. 28 points, 
well over 300 yards total offense and just shred them. Oklahoma State said this, they can't run on us, so we're going to bring our corners up and press and drop seven. I mean, it's literally all they did. And Notre Dame could do nothing about it because the receivers literally didn't have to – couldn't get off the line. Like Braden Lindsay's talking during fall camp, like, hey, I got a, I got a release package now. I'm like, how sad is it yeah. that a fifth-year senior is finally talking about how he's been taught how to get off the line of scrimmage? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like somebody was stealing a paycheck the last four years with that yeah. kid. But, I mean, that's the expectation is, okay, athleticism is fine. Talent is fine. But if it's not functional football speed and talent, then it doesn't matter. And I think that's the kind of thing that's held Notre Dame back. But, you know, Braden Lindsay's another guy. He was a track champion in high school, a kid that's very dynamic speed-wise. It's about – giving him time to throw. If you go back and watch them all 22 from early last year, I mean, he's beating guys by four or five yards. And then you look back, like, why didn't the ball come? Because Jack Cohn's like running for his life or getting sacked or, you know, whatever the case may be. So talent is there. I mean, there's athleticism there to to make big plays. It's just, can they, can they play the game at a, at a technical level the way they need to? Can they play it at a physical level? Because we did a breakdown on uh, Wednesday, Jay, or, or Tuesday, then we talked about is if you're playing if you're playing secondary in a Jim Knowles defense, you better be physical. Yeah, like, there's no excuse for hey I'm just a cover guy. Nope, not if you're going to play for Jim Knowles, right? You're going to battle, and so we saw that they just out physical the Notre Dame speed and talent in the second half. None of those Oklahoma State kids could run with Notre Dame's receivers, and Kevin Austin was the slowest Notre Dame receiver they had last year. He ran a four four three at the combine. He was literally the third slowest receiver they had in the starting lineup behind a, behind Braden Lindsey. And and uh, Lorenzo Styles, but that speed doesn't matter when my hands in your chest and I'm jamming you and riding you into the line into the sideline, right? And that's what was happening. So the technical skill is going to have to match the physical skill, and that's what we don't know yet. We don't know if they're going to be there yet. They hired Chancey Stuckey to fix that. He did a great job, kind of getting Baylor's receivers going from pretty bad in 2020 to you know pretty good last year in 2021 for a team that was a bit of a ball control offense, but still a big play group. So that's the expectation is, you know, can Braden Lindsay get going? Can Lorenzo Styles get going? Obviously, you know about Mayer, Chris Tyree. They got a couple other young running backs that people are going to know about real soon. And that's Aldrich Estime, who's six foot, 230 pound bowling ball. And then Logan Diggs, who's a kid from Louisiana, six foot, 215. He's kind of like, you know, Estime is a big physical kid with, you know, nice feet. And, and Tyree's like the one cut home run hitter. And then there's Logan Diggs, who's not real fast. You know, he's, he's 215, but not like a hammer. But he's just smooth, right? And so they've got a nice backfield. It's just last year, the backfield was never able to get time to move. I mean, if you go look at Kyron Williams, had a 90, I think a 94-yard touchdown run against North Carolina. If you go back and watch the plays, 91, I think, is what it was. If you go back and watch the play, he got hit by three guys behind the line of scrimmage. Yeah. But he yeah. bounced off them and then, like, kind of runs around and eventually goes. It's like, that wasn't a play that the offensive line had anything to do with. You know what I mean? That's just a kid that was really talented. And we saw that so many times last year. It's like, oh, my gosh. Like, And that's what I think gets a Notre Dame fans excited. Like, man, if, a, if they had a competent offensive line, imagine what they could do. You know? And I think that's what we're going to find out this year is, is okay, is that optimism – like legitimate is it is it warranted well, we're gonna find out and they're gonna find out real quick right they're gonna find out immediately there's no warm-up games we're gonna find out real quick if that if that talent if that optimism is warranted they're gonna find out real quickly just like the defense is gonna find out really quickly from Notre Dame can they stand up to what is hyped up to be one of the better offenses if not the best offense in the country there's a player by the name of Isaiah Foskey you and I talk about him on air off air doesn't matter his name comes up. He's a guy that I believe Paris Johnson Jr. recently talked about and said, Foskey is good. But going up against Tui Malowal and Sawyer in practice, he believes those guys have prepared him in a great way for Foskey in this game on Saturday. And he even talked about I, – I don't want to misquote it. I'm not going to try to sure. say the quote and then misquote it. Someone's like, Jay, you said it wrong. Like, So I just won't touch it. But he did talk about how those guys on his team, those sophomores, prepared him for a guy like Foskey. Great. I hope they can. Because what I see from Foskey, Brian, this guy's really good. He is. And, and that's what great teams are supposed to be about, right? I mean, you know, we going back to Pete Carroll, you know, Pete Carroll used to always say this. It's like, look, practice was was the hardest part of our week. Yeah. Because you know, you're going yeah. against other great players. I mean, it, it was funny in, in 2017 watching Notre Dame. We're going in that season like they're coming off a four and eight year. And in practice, the Notre Dame offense is just ripping off 67 yard touchdown run after 67 yard touchdown. Thinking, this defense is going to be freaking terrible. They're awful. 
And I remember talking to Mike Elko in a press conference, like, no, no, no. He's like, look, that group right there is a bunch of human lie detectors. Talking about the Notre Dame offensive line. Like, it's more about how good they are. Well, then come to find out that Notre Dame defense was pretty good that year. You know, I ended up they ended up going from four and eight to ten and three, and and the run game got a lot better. And it was it was really it was true. I mean, it was they, that offensive line goes out and wins the Joe Moore Award. Josh Adams rushes for fourteen hundred yards. I mean, you know, they ran over three hundred yards against an NC State defense that had four the starting four defensive linemen all got drafted fourth round or higher, and their starting middle linebacker is a third round pick who started for the Bengals in the Super Bowl last year, right? Like that's what the game is supposed to be about if you're an elite team. You know, playing against Jack Sawyer and Zach Harrison and JT is supposed to make you better prepared for Isaiah Foskey. But then when you get to Saturday night, it's like, okay, but Isaiah Foskey's got a little something, and you don't have practice after practice after practice that's to it. get prepared for that's him. It. And that's what kind of makes it tough. But, you know, will he be prepared for it? I mean, he's going to he's gonna be as prepared as he possibly can be. And that's where you want to be as a program, right? Those those battles are supposed to be about. But, you know, Isaiah is a, a talented kid. He's big. He's 6'5". He's 265. He's got incredibly long arms, really broad shoulders, so a great wingspan. And the impressive thing about him last year, Jay, is he really kind of only had like one move, right? And it was just that long arm. He would just kind of come off. Like there was a, a sack he had against USC – where he comes off the line, he's rushing off the right end, and he just takes his left arm and he just puts it into the offensive tackle's chest and he drives the guy back as he's running around him, takes his right arm, his free arm, as he's pushing the – and he knocks the ball out of the quarterback's hands. And you're like, good Lord. Like, you, can, you can't take credit for that as a coach. Like, that dude's just – that dude's just better than everybody that I have ever coached before, you know. And now it's about, okay, can he expand his repertoire? Can he can – he, no, they're going to be prepared for that long arm, right? Paris Johnson's six six and really long arms. Dewan Jones is, you know, he may have some issues, but the one thing about him is he's long, he's big, you know. So, so he's going to need something more than just that long arm, you know, move off the edge. Can he develop a counter moves? Can he can he do things where, if they're sliding protection to him, you know, does he have answers for that? Can he be a little bit more effective at the point in the run game? That's going to be a big part of this game. And so, you know, that's that's going to be an important part. But if you're Ohio State, I think it'd be kind of foolish to just say, leave your guys on an island against Isaiah Foskey. My my whole thing is, I'm going to make somebody else beat me. Make Jason Adam Yola beat you. Make Riley Mills beat you. Make somebody else beat you. I'm not going to let Isaiah Foskey take this game over. Because, you know, when like Notre Dame was playing Cincinnati last year, 17-0, they're dominating Notre Dame. Just dominating Notre Dame. And they're driving, and they're ready to put this game away in the first half. Or I think it might actually been early third quarter, if, if I remember correctly. And what happens? Foskey comes off the edge, sacks Desmond Ritter, strips the ball out. Notre Dame recovers it, runs it back a long ways, end up scoring a touchdown. All of a sudden, this game you've been dominating, Notre Dame now gets a score, got some momentum, made a 17-13, and turned the game that really wasn't competitive into a close game. And he, he let them tied for the nation lead and forced fumbles last year, so – He's a really talented kid, but the thing is, last year was his first year as a regular in the rotation. I mean, he's he's got a he's got more improvement he can make. The question is, can he make it? Because he's going to need to. Because these are these are two very long, talented to varying degrees tackles. I think Paris Johnson's more naturally talented than Dewan Jones, but at least Dewan, like I said, he's he's you know he's lost the weight, he's put in the work, he's a really long kid. Paris is incredibly physically gifted. You know, learning the left tackle position. You know, but the same thing is true for him as it is for Tyler Buckner. It's one thing to do it in practice. It's nothing to do it in a game when there's 105,000 people watching. And that's what we're going to find out with both of these teams is, okay, who can do it in that moment? And that's what separates the teams that are talented from the teams that are actually good. And that's what we're going to find out. We're running short on time. Had a lot of good stuff with you, Brian. I really appreciate you coming on once again to help us get all the news nuggets and uh, nerd notes that we need for this game. Who are some other guys on this defense? Isaiah Foskey's one guy we highlighted. Everyone's going to see him all over the field um, on Saturday night. But who are some other guys on this defense Buckeye fans need to know about? Cam Hart, cornerback Cam Hart's a, a, an intriguing player. He's in the Rams field corner, six two and a half, over 200 pounds. He was on Bruce Feldman's freak list. You know, they talk about his miles per hour. He's a kid that's a legitimate low 4-4 kid that's 6'2", 205. Uh, was a former receiver, came to Notre Dame as a mm. wide receiver, and is now going into his second year. He never really played much until last year, had a breakout season. He's a very talented player. You know about Brandon Joseph. And then another two two guys real quick, Riley Mills is Notre Dame's big, big end. He's like, that's literally the name of their position. It's <laughs> called the big end. Uh, it's the big end in the Viper. You know, 6'5 kid, you know, 290 pounds as an, as an end. You know, he was a D tackle last year. He had to step in at end against Virginia, had two sacks. He's just more natural on the edge. 
He's a guy that's got to really play well. And then, as I mentioned earlier, Maris Lufau, 6'3", 230 pound kid from Hawaii, very athletic, very rangy, brings a lot more explosiveness to that will position than what Notre Dame had last year, which then allowed them to move JD Bertrand inside to Mike, where he's more comfortable. JD led him in tackles last year, but he's playing out of position at will, which is a space player. And JD's 6'1, 230. He's meant to be right over the ball. So I think him returning allows them to kind of put a little bit more. Uh, impactful linebacking core on the defense because that was the one position on defense last year that just underachieved all year. Uh, I think getting Maris back is going to be a big, big part of that for the Notre Dame defense. Brian, the game's almost here. This preview was amazing. I'm glad you're able to come back on the show once again. If you could, as people on YouTube can see, your Twitter handle is under your name. But for those that are listening to the audio version of this show, where can they follow you on Twitter? And then where can they read some of the Irish side of things leading up to the game to get ready for, if they want to get that side of the of the landscape. You can find me on Twitter at Coach D. D is in David. Coach D178 is where you can find me on Twitter. And any other platform, website, www.irishbreakdown.com. You can search Irish Breakdown on YouTube. You can search it on your podcast uh, platform, wherever you can find it. I'm a former coach. I hired a guy to, who's a former draft analyst to, to kind of do it. We try to, we try to stick to, you know, analysis and, 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 not kind of get into the clickbaity, that type of stuff. We really try to dive into the weeds of, of matchups and stats and that kind of stuff to really make it a football talk. So if we're wrong, we're at least talking ball. And, and, yeah. and we think that, you know, we bring a little different element to it than what you find in some other places. So you can definitely check us out there. We're talking about Ohio State all week. So irishbreakdown.com is where you can find us. And then look, search for Irish Breakdown and any other platform where you're getting shows. You can obviously look for us there as well. And, guys, you can follow me on Twitter at jstevens07. Finally, you went back to the OG logo consistently here on the podcast. Uh, I've been looking for this logo to get to get it back here, and I'm glad we get this background backdrop here when Brian and I are, are on the show. You can send your emails to jstevens317 at gmail.com. Happy to be here. Game's two days away. I am excited. I hope you're ready. I know Brian is. I know I am. <laughs> get ready. If, you got, if you're having a party this weekend, I hope your menu and, and food is prepared. At least you know what you're getting. Because if not, it might be sold out at the stores. Brian Driscoll of irishbreakdown.com. Thank you for coming back on Lockdown Buckeyes. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on.